Chapter 19, Part A. We're still dealing with the cardiovascular system, but now we're looking at the blood vessels. We're going to look at how the body is going to control the blood pressure uh, under normal conditions so that when you're dealing with a patient uh, who has either too high or too low blood pressure, you can help understand why, what needs to be done to alleviate that problem. Understand Understand the underlying anatomy helps you to understand the physiology of the blood pressure. When we look at the blood vessels, uh, it's a closed system uh, delivering blood throughout the body from the heart. Um, in addition to the blood vessels, the blood's also going to work with the lymphatic vessels because it is also obtaining fluids. One thing you'll learn is that fluid. The, with the blood, when it goes to the capillaries, some of the fluid that leaks out, not all of it is returned to the blood immediately. And so the lymphatic system is going to work to retrieve the remaining fluid and ultimately return it to the blood. So because the uh, lymphatic system does return the lymph or the fluid that's in it to the blood, it is associated. Um, and, and we have to keep that in mind. Very basically, there are four types of blood, or three types of blood vessels. Main ones, there's the arteries, the capillaries, and the veins. Now, there are some additional ones. Between the arteries and the capillaries, there are arterioles. Between the capillaries and the veins, there are venules. So if we look at these top three, arteries are going to be carrying blood away from the heart. Uh, in in most cases, it's going to be oxygenated, but not always. Capillaries, these are the smallest diameter size of the blood vessels. <coughs> and this is where the exchange is going to occur of the nutrients, the waste products, gas exchange, etc. And then the veins are carrying the blood back towards the heart. In most cases, it's deoxygenated, but once again, not always. And so this diagram is showing you from the heart, you've got the arteries uh, leading away. They're usually large diameter, but the farther you move away from the heart, the diameter gets smaller and smaller, and you have successive branches um, as you feed the various areas of the body. When you get down to individual tissue layers, you can look and see the arterioles are even smaller diameter as compared to the arteries, and eventually you end up with the capillaries. And as I said, that's where all of your exchange will occur. And then on the other side of the capillaries, you have the venules, and then the diameter is going to slowly uh, increase in size, and you have branches that merge together until eventually you have your veins and ultimately the large veins return the blood back to the heart. You can kind of equate it as the heart's kind of like a big city. As you move away from the big city on the interstate systems, you have multiple exits and you might in the city have six lanes, but as you gradually move further and further away from the city, these exits Roadways are branching off from the interstate, and you go down to maybe four lanes and finally down to two lanes. Out in the country, you have the smallest, maybe little country farm roads, and then they're going to start to merge together to form the two lane highway, and then finally merge onto the interstate. And then you've got other highways merging onto the interstate until you approach the big city, you gradually have to add larger and more lanes. Um, so if that analogy helps you kind of visualize what when you look at the structure of the blood vessels, all of the vessels will contain a, what we call lumen. That is the space that's in the middle where the blood's going to be flowing and there's going to be a wall surrounding it. All of the blood vessels will have three layers except for the capillaries. 
These three layers, you know how we are in anatomy. We call them tunics because layers would be too easy. So we've got first the tunica intima, then the tunica media, and then the tunica externa. Now the capillaries, like I said, um, are different. Uh, they, <coughs> excuse me, have endothelium, which is the very uh, thin layer of basal lamina. Sooners to allow for exchange to occur. The tunica intima, this is the innermost, as the name implies, so it's going to have the direct contact with the blood. It is composed of simple squamous epithelium. It is continuous endocardium. And this surface is nice and smooth so that you do not have friction. <coughs> Excuse me. The tunica media is the middle layer. It's mostly smooth muscle. There's also sheets of elastin. Um, there are sympathetic nerve fibers that will innervate this um, smooth muscle layer so that you can have two things occur. You can have vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Vasoconstriction is going to uh, trigger that smooth muscle to constrict in such a way that the overall diameter of the lumen, so the interior diameter, is going to decrease. That in turn decreases the amount of blood flow through that vessel. Basal dilation is going to increase the diameter so that you therefore increase the blood flow through there. So it's going to be this middle layer, this tunica media, the smooth muscle, that's going to be involved with um, changing the diameter of the blood vessel, and that's going to be controlled by the sympathetic uh, nerve system. The tunica externa is the outermost. Sometimes it's called the tunica adventitia. It's mostly uh, collagen fibers. They're helping to protect and reinforce the wall of the blood vessel. They're helping to anchor the wall to um, the surrounding structure. So you don't want the blood vessel just randomly sliding back and forth. Um, it's usually is innervated with nerve fibers. You've got lymphatic vessels that are also, um, lymphatic vessels are usually can be run in parallel with. So in this diagram, you can see on the left is an artery, on the right is a vein, and down at the bottom is a capillary. But you can see how the three different layers are listed and the little subdivisions within them. Once again, tunica intima innermost, tunica media is the muscle. You'll notice here, and we'll talk about this in a bit, the tunica media, the muscle uh, is thicker in the artery than in the vein. And then you've got the tunica externa. With arteries, this is showing you uh, in this table just kind of a, a visual diagram of we have different types of arteries, elastic arteries, muscular arteries, the arterioles, and it's comparing the different layers. And then with uh, comparison continuing on between the capillary, the venule, and then the, the vein. So I said those arteries are divided into three groups. It's based on size, it's based on the function, and arterioles, the elastic arteries, they're very uh, thick walled. They have low resistance in the lumen. Um, these are going to include the aorta, which is the largest blood vessel in the body, and its major branches. Um, the elastin that's found in this is it's mostly uh, in the tunica media, though it can be found in all three of the tunics. You do have a fair amount of smooth muscle that is composed within the elastic arteries. They can um, expand and recoil as the blood's being pumped from the heart. They have to be able to withstand a lot of pressure. And you want to have that continuous blood flow uh, even between 
the contractions. The blood flow doesn't go in spurts, it needs to be continuous. The muscular arteries uh, are going to be a little bit smaller than the elastic arteries. Um, they're the ones that are going to be helping after the branching, helping to distribute to the various tissues. Um, most of your named arteries are going to be muscular arteries. They have a little bit less elastic tissue, but they do have a lot of the smooth muscle once again. These are going to play a huge role with vasoconstriction. And then the arterioles are the smallest of all the arteries. Um, and they're going to be regulating the amount of blood flow into the capillary beds. Um, sometimes they are referred to as resistance arteries just because uh, they can often change the diameter and that's going to play a role with resistance to the blood flow. If you decrease the diameter, you're going to increase the resistance. But like I say, they're going to feed in capillary beds. Your capillaries are the smallest of the blood vessels. The diameter is small enough that it allows only one red blood cell to pass through at a time. The walls are very thin to allow for um, the nutrient and gas exchange to occur. There are parasites, these are spider shaped stem cells that kind of help to stabilize the, the capillary walls because they're only about one cell in thickness. Um, they are going to be supplying every cell with my the gas and the nutrients in it, and then removing the waste products. So capillaries are found everywhere in all the tissues except in cartilage, in the epithelial, in the cornea, and then the lens of the eye. Those are the, the four places where you do not have capillaries. And as I said, the, the function of them is for that exchange to occur. So the capillary epithelial cells are joined by tight junctions, but they will have little gaps in them. That's what allows for the fluid, the cells to pass. There's three main types of capillaries. There's what we call continuous capillaries. These are very uh, common in the skin, the muscles, lungs, central nervous system. Um, now, in the brain, they have some unique functions because you have what we call the blood-brain barrier. So there are no intracellular clefts. The, they're totally enclosed within these tight junctions to add that extra protection. So this is showing the continuous uh, capillary. Fenestrate capillaries are found where you're going to have a lot of excessive movement in and out of the capillaries, such as filtration that occurs in the kidneys, absorption that's going to occur in your intestines, and then also with the endocrine uh, secretion, the secretion of the hormones. And so the endothelial cells contain what we call fenestrations, which is just a fancy way of saying it has pores. It has a bunch of little holes in it, like Swiss cheese has holes in it. That allows for increased permeability, which means it allows for increased movement of the fluids. And it goes in both directions, not only out of the capillaries into the interstitial fluid, but from that interstitial fluid, that fluid that's between the cells of the tissues, back into the blood. And there's usually a very thin uh, layer over, as you can see here. Um, the numerous the little holes that's what the fenestrations are and then you have the sinusoidal capillaries um, these are found only in the liver the bone marrow the spleen and in the adrenal medulla um, it allows for the passage of some larger molecules to pass between the blood and the tissue the, basically, in these areas, the blood flow is a little bit slower, it's a, a little bit sluggish, so it allows the time for these larger um, molecules to pass. They usually also have an increased number of macrophages in the lining to, as a protective thing to try to destroy any foreign substance that may be. 
And so this is showing you notice the concentration is much larger. Um, the capillary bed, this is the area between the arterioles. So the blood has left the heart. It's traveling through the arteries down to the arterioles. And then when it reaches the capillaries, it's going to go through what we call a capillary bed. It's this whole network of capillaries. It's not just one little tiny vessel. There's lots of branches. And so this area with all these capillaries is referred to as the capillary bed. So at one end, the blood is flowing from the arterioles into the capillary bed, and the other end is going to be connected to the venules. Um, now, you have different types of vessels in here. You've got the true capillaries where the exchange is actually going to occur. And then <coughs> you have what's known as a vascular shunt. This is kind of think of it as like the main road that's connecting the arterial to the venule. This vascular shunt, um, you have that, that arterial that's going to feed into it. You have this thoroughfare channel, the main uh, capillary, that then is going to feed into the venule. And you can regulate the amount of blood flow through here depending needs are at this particular time. So at this diagram, at this point you can see over on the left hand side you have the arteriole, the blood's flowing through it, and then when it makes that turn to enter into the vascular shunt, which is that main capillary in the middle that goes straight from the arteriole to the venule, notice there are some what we call sphincters, the precapillary sphincters. Those are essentially small muscles, and they can um, constrict and relax. In other words, they can close off. It's like closing off the side road of the highway. It's closing off those side um, true capillaries, the blood flow. So depending on the needs, if you need to decrease the flow through there, those sphincters can close off the blood flow and allow the blood just to flow through that vascular shunt and it not go through the side capillaries. It's kind of like putting a roadblock up and you have to go down the main road, only you can't take the side road. How many true capillaries are there? Anywhere from 10 to 100 per capillary bed. Um, and as I said, those Precapillary sphincters are going to help to regulate the flow of the blood through the, the true capillaries. So here's a nice diagram that shows on the top when they are open and it's allowing the blood flow to go through those true capillaries, through that entire capillary bed. And then when they are closed, like I said, it's like putting up a roadblock and it prevents the blood flow through the, the true capillaries. It just goes through the vascular shunt. And then whether they're open or closed, the blood is then going to, um, on the other end of the capillary bed, flow into the venule. Veins are carrying the blood now back towards the heart. Um, so the blood flow goes into the venules. The venules are going to all start to kind of merge together and form the veins. So the venules, um, as I said, are connected to the capillary bed. They um, tend to be very porous. That allows fluid and white blood cells and tissues. Um, and then the veins are going to be larger diameter. Their walls are thinner as compared to arteries. You don't have as much uh, or as high of a blood pressure. Uh, the tunica externa is thicker, but the tunica media is thinner as compared to arteries. The lumen is fairly large. And so like I say, the, the blood um, pressure is lower. And if you look here, because the muscular portion of the wall is thinner in veins. If you do a cross section, usually it looks like the vein is collapsed um, because that muscle is helping to maintain the shape of the blood vessel in the artery. 
So that's kind of a clue for you when you're looking at histology slides. If it's nice and round, circular, maintains its shape, that is an artery. Why? Because it's got the thicker muscle wall, as you can see, and it helps to maintain the shape. It has to be stronger from that standpoint to withstand the higher pressure. The vein is going to look like it's collapsed. Now, when the blood is actually flowing through it, it is round, but when it's empty, it's when you do a tissue sample like this, um, the, it looks like the wall has collapsed. This uh, pie chart is showing you the proportion of the volume of blood that's in the vascular system in terms of comparing how much blood's going to be in the heart versus in the capillaries. And as you can see, most of the blood, about 60%, will be in the veins and the venules of the systemic circulatory system. As I said, the blood pressure is going to be lower in the veins. Um, so there have to be some adaptations here to help keep the blood flowing. <coughs> some of those adaptations include valves. You do have valves in the veins that helps to prevent backflow of the blood. Uh, they're more common in your arms and legs. As it's having to also fight gravity to get that. You've got lower pressure. You're fighting gravity. You want to prevent black backflow from occurring. So these veins, kind of like we can push it up a bit to the next valve in the veins. That's the way the veins are going to be moving the blood. Uh, there's vein sinuses. Uh, this is where uh, the veins are kind of flat and they tend to have very thin walls. Um, and an example of that is the coronary sinus, which drains the blood back from the heart muscle itself back into the heart. And also we see this in the brain. So once again, here's a diagram of the various blood vessels in the comparison of them. And once again, a chart comparing the average diameter, the wall thickness, and the different within each vessels. What are some clinical manifestations? Varicose veins. Varicose veins, they're dilated veins, they tend to be painful because essentially the valves are leaking. They're incompetent, they're not working properly. What leads to varicose veins? Some of it's genetics, and some of it are other conditions that are interfering with the proper blood flow, the proper return of the blood to the heart. These are constantly standing, especially if you just stand, say, like assembly line workers who may not be moving much. They're on their feet all day long in one position. That's not good. If you're overweight, if you're pregnant, that can increase risk values for um, forming varicose veins. If there's elevated pressure in the vein that can lead to varicose veins, such as, once again, during pregnancy, during delivery, straining to deliver during labor, straining for bowel movements, can lead to this. <coughs> and stoicis are interconnections of the blood vessels. Um, sometimes you have these interconnections like with the arteries to help ensure that if one artery gets blocked, you're still going to ensure blood flow to a particular area. This is common in joints and a lot of the abdominal organs, certainly in the brain and in the heart. So that, like I say, you have a blockage in one artery, you still are supplying the nutrients to um, involved there. Arterial venous anastomosis or shunts in the capillaries, where once again you have all of these various, um, they look like all the side roads, all the branches that are occurring. So that if one of those small true capillaries gets plugged, you're still getting once again blood flow. Um, in the veins, it's very abundant so that if you have a blocked vein, usually that's not going to uh, totally block. If we look at the physiology of circulation, several different things to look at are the blood flow, the blood pressure, and resistance. 
the blood flow is the amount of volume that's flowing through a vessel or through an organ, or you can look at the entire circulation within a certain time period. What's the blood flow? It's going to be measured in millimeters per minute. Uh, so it's going to be similar to cardiac output uh, when we look at the heart. Overall, it should be relatively constant when at rest. But if you look at an individual organ, it's going to vary depending on what the needs are at that particular time. Blood pressure is the amount of force that's put upon the, the wall of the blood vessel because of the blood flowing through. Um, it is going to be highest near your larger arteries of the heart, and then it tends to decrease the further away you get from the heart. <coughs> Resistance. Resistance is an opposition to flow. Uh, what type of friction do, does the blood encounter as it's flowing through the blood vessels? Um, that's why, remember, the inner wall is very smooth to reduce the friction, to reduce that resistance. But there um, are things that can play a role with the resistance, like blood viscosity, total blood vessel length, and total or the blood vessel diameter. So if we look at the blood viscosity, viscosity refers to the thickness or stickiness of blood. Um, just to give you an idea, an analogy would be, you're all familiar how freely water flows. But if you're, let's say you've made pancakes and you go to pour syrup on your pancakes, you know how the syrup is going to flow uh, slower, it's thicker than water. You gotta wait a little longer to pour that syrup out, it's stickier. So you would say that syrup is very viscous. So that just might give you a little bit of a visual, something that you can maybe relate to a little bit better when we're talking about viscosity. Uh, the blood is viscous, more viscous than, than water. Why is that? Because it has those formed elements and the plasma protein center. So the greater the viscosity, the greater the thickness, the slower it's going to move. Um, so that's going to cause increased resistance. The longer a blood vessel is, the greater the resistance is going to be. You have more chance of encountering. And then the third one is the blood vessel diameter. That's going to be the greatest thing that's going to affect resistance. You can change the diameter of the blood vessel, as we've said previously, and that's going to alter the resistance. So, um, lambda flow refers to the flow of the blood right along the wall, so it's going to flow a little bit uh, slower there than in the middle. Think of a river. A large river, the current is going to be strongest in the middle. It's going to be slower along the shoreline because it's meeting the resistance of the shoreline. It's the same type of thing with your blood vessels. Your larger blood vessels, in the middle, the blood is flowing faster than right along the, the edges where, like I said, it's called laminar flow. Um, as the diameter of the blood vessel increases, the resistance is going to decrease. So that is one thing that you're, you're going to see will happen is the body can make adjustments in the diameter of the blood vessels, uh, depending on what the needs are. If you just ate a huge meal or a snack, whatever, and the digestive system is now having to break down those food items or drink items, whatever you consumed. You need to increase the amount of blood going to the digestive organs. And so, like the, the small intestines, you're going to increase blood flow there. How do you increase blood flow? Increase the diameter of the blood vessels going to the small intestines. You increase the diameter 
you're increasing the internal size. That's allowing increased blood flow. There's decreased resistance now. You've got more volume going through, so there's, there's less resistance. You get more blood going to that area, which is what you want, because you need to absorb all the nutrients from everything you just ate. Do you need to have as much uh, blood going to the kidneys right now? Not at this moment. So what the body's going to do is decrease the diameter of the blood vessels, say, in the kidneys for just right now. And you don't cut it off completely, but it's a way of kind of shuffling. Where do I need the blood right now? So just keep in mind, you change the diameter, that's going to change the amount of blood flow going through, and that's going to have an effect on resistance. Um, one thing that can also increase resistance that is associated with the diameter is if you start to have... Um, any type of blockages or obstacles in the blood vessels, such as plaque buildup. And that certainly is one of the huge concerns with our arteriosclerosis. Is that you start getting these uh, fatty plaques build up in the blood vessel itself, in that lumen area, and that's going to start blocking the flow. It's adding resistance. Um, and, and that ultimately is additional problems. So blood flow is going to be directly, directly proportional to what the blood pressure gradient is, a change in that blood pressure. If the blood pressure gradient increases, the blood flow is going to speed up. If the resistance increases, the blood flow is going to decrease. There's more resistance slowing it down. So the, the heart, with it pumping, is what generates that blood flow. And the pressure is going to result from when the flow is meeting up with resistance. The pressure is highest in the aorta. And as I've said, as you move further away from the heart, it's going, the systemic pressure is going to decrease. This is a diagram showing the pressure, as you can see on the bottom line of the graph, showing from the order, and then certainly by the time it's in the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, returning back to the heart, uh, there's very low, low point. Arterial blood pressure can be determined by two things, elasticity of the arteries and the volume of blood flow that's going through it. With each heartbeat, you're going to have the pressure. It's going to increase, decrease. So it's pulsing. <coughs> the systolic pressure, that is the pressure that's um, related to ventricular contraction. And diastolic pressure is associated with uh, the heart when it's relaxing. Um, It kind of varies. Um, on average, they say on average, the blood pressure should be about 120 over 80. What that means, the systolic is the upper number, and then diastolic would be the lower number. They've kind of changed that down to about 110 over 70. The idea is you don't want the pressure to be too high. Pulse pressure, that's the difference between those two systolic and diastolic pressure readings. Uh, the pulse that's the, uh, is felt, the throbbing of the arteries due to the difference in the, the pressures. Um, and certainly you can see all that. Mean arterial pressure, that is the pressure that's helping to move that blood into the tissues. A mean arterial pressure, you can calculate that. Um, you can take the diastolic pressure and then add a third of what the pulse pressure is. That's a way of, of getting additional measurements. Um,
both the pulse pressure and the, the mean arterial pressure are going to decline the farther away from the heart. So there's ways that you can measure the uh, efficiency of your um, blood flow, the, basically the efficiency of your cardiovascular system. You look at vital signs. Some of you are very familiar with this. The vital signs, you can get the pulse, you can get the blood pressure. You can also look at respiratory rate, body temperature. Uh, to take a pulse, you can get the radial pulse. This is probably one of the most common ways of taking a pulse where you take it at the wrist. Um, there are different areas that we call pressure points where the arteries are very close to the body surface. And so these pressure points are areas that you can uh, compress them, push down on them to stop the blood flow in case somebody is bleeding. And this diagram shows where um, these major pressure points are. measure the blood pressure um, usually what you're going to do is using a stethoscope you need to listen you're going to use your sphygmomanometer which is basically the blood pressure cuff the fancy name that we use for that um, you're going to wrap it around the arm above the elbow um, and you're going to increase the pressure in the cuff and then slowly release it, but not too slow. And you're listening with the stethoscope for this. Um, basically, the first sound is going to be the systolic pressure. You need to look at your gauge to see what number it's at. That is when the blood starts to go through the artery. Because with the blood pressure cuff, you've essentially stopped the blood flow through. And so that first sound is when the blood starts to spurt through the artery. And then the diastolic pressure which is your second number, that's going to be the last sound you hear before the, all the sounds disappear. That's because, why is there no more sound? It's because now the artery is no longer constricted and the blood's flowing freely through it. You want the pressure to be fairly low in the capillary bed. It's, it's highest at the beginning of the capillary bed and lowest at the end. So you, you have this gradient. Um, but you overall want the pressure low because if it's too high, it's... Remember, the capillary walls are only one cell thick. So they're fairly fragile. So if the blood pressure is too high, it's going to burst or rupture those the capillary walls. Um, in the veins... Uh, the pressure gradient is fairly small. Um, so there's a difference if you have an injury to a vein versus an artery. Uh, if a vein is cut, the, because the pressure is low, the blood's going to just come out very smoothly. It may come out fast, but it's, it's in a smooth, even flow. If an artery is cut, that is when some of you may have seen pictures of somebody who's uh, damaged uh, an artery and you see that spurting. It's because the pressure is higher and you have that spurting because of the, the heart rate. Um, and so you can you can tell whether someone if someone's had an injury and they're cut, the way the blood is flowing, whether they've damaged an artery versus a vein. Also, just as a side note, because the pressure is lower in the, the veins, that is why when you draw blood, you do a vena puncture, meaning you are drawing the blood from a vein. The reason for that, it's much easier because the, the blood pressure is lower in the vein. And when you've ever had blood drawn or if you draw blood from someone, you'll notice how usually that will start by hopefully um, drawing blood from a vein, usually around your elbow. And when they are feeling palpitating, they're, they're feeling for the valve. You don't want to insert the needle right at a valve because you don't want to damage the valve or go through it. So they're going to feel for the valve and then go just beyond that.
there's certain times where you may have to do a stick in an artery, but you need training for that. That's much more difficult because of the pressure. So how are you returning the blood through the veins back to the heart when there is um, such low pressure? How do you get it back? Well, one thing that's going to help with the return, remember they have the valves that help to prevent backflow. But then surrounding um, the the blood vessels, you know, are all embedded, obviously, throughout your body. And there's usually skeletal muscles surrounding them. And so the skeletal muscles are constantly having contractions. Some of them are so slight. You're not consciously aware of it. That helps to maintain your posture, etc. But what this is also doing, think of it kind of as, as the skeletal muscle contracts in one area around a vein. It's, it kind of helps to push the blood up. up little bit and then the next muscle is going to contract some and pushes it up a little bit forward and so it's referred to as milking and that helps um, also along with the valves to prevent backflow and, and return it towards the heart the respiratory pump is the pressure changes during breathing that are also helping to move blood towards the heart um, because of the changes with the thoracic uh, veins and then uh, you also have some constriction of the veins under the sympathetic control. The smooth muscles constrict, and that's going to also help push the blood back towards the heart. So this is showing that milking action of the skeletal muscles. It also shows the valves. So obviously it's a coordinated effort to keep that blood flowing um, and maintaining the blood pressure at appropriate levels. And so it's a cooperation and maintenance between the heart, the blood vessels, and the kidneys are going to play a role. And the brain obviously is controlling all this. <coughs> and so um, there has to be a very well coordinated aspect to this. Three main factors regulating blood pressure, cardiac output, peripheral resistance, and blood volume. And a lot of these formulas uh, you can use to calculate and see the effect. Basically, what I want you to get from it is that if you change one of these variables, you're going to have compensation or changes with some of the other variables as they compensate for a change. So if something increases, the others are going to compensate for that increase. Or if something decreases, you'll have compensation for that. So anything that's going to increase things like the stroke volume, the heart rate, the resistance, are also going to increase that uh, medium arterial pressure. There can be factors that can be affected by uh, neural controls, hormonal controls, renal controls that affect short-term versus long-term regulation. So once again, this diagram is just showing with the mean arterial pressure and the different components or factors that play a role in helping to determine. With neural controls, these are short-term controls. Uh, the mean arterial pressure is maintained by altering the blood vessel diameter. That's going to also alter the resistance. So basically, if, say, there's been an injury or something and you're bleeding and the blood volume starts to drop, what's going to happen is that all the rest of the blood vessels are going to constrict, other than in the heart and the brain. They're going to constrict because if they constrict, that will reduce the blood volume flowing through, and that's going to help try to maintain the proper blood pressure. <coughs> As I said earlier, you can also constrict or relax blood vessels. The diameter changing that alters the amount of blood flow to a specific order, depending on what the demands are at that particular time. So usually the neural controls 
are operated by reflex arcs. It's going to involve, uh, in the medulla, there's a cardiovascular center. It's going to involve baroreceptors. They're detecting changes in pressure, chemoreceptors, and then some of your higher as well. So the cardiovascular center is involving the sympathetic neurons. Um, we're basically, it's getting input from the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors and also the higher brain centers. The baroreceptors, these are located in the carotid sinuses, the aortic arch, in the walls of your larger arteries in the necks and the thorax. So if the mean arterial pressure is high, increased blood pressure is going to uh, stimulate these baroreceptors, and that's going to send the information to uh, the various centers of the brain, stimulate them, and basically send the message pressure is too high, we need to decrease it. So uh, how are you going to decrease? Once again, it has to do with changing the diameter of the blood vessels. If you increase the diameter of the blood vessel, that's going to decrease the pressure if you uh, constrict the blood vessels or decrease the diameter, then that's going to increase the blood pressure. Decreased cardiac output, um, basically the way this is done, you have to decrease the heart rate, slow it down a bit. So once again, if the mean arterial pressure is, is low, then you need to increase the cardiac output, increase the blood pressure. And so this is just putting all this together in this graph once again. To maintain homeostasis, you want to keep your blood pressure in a normal range. You don't want it getting too high or too low. But if it does get high, then the uh, you have all these receptors that can detect these changes and then make changes as deemed appropriate. If the blood pressure gets too high or too low, these adaptations are made to try to bring it back within that normal range. There are chemoreceptors located uh, in the aortic arch, the large arteries of the neck, that can detect an increase in carbon dioxide. Um, they also can detect a drop in the pH, so if it's, the blood's becoming too acidic, or a drop in oxygen. Um, and they're going to signal um, a change to try to remedy. A lot of this is going to involve uh, the medulla, where some of the, the centers are, and then also in the higher brain and the hypothalamus, remember, is controlling or regulating a lot of things dealing with homeostasis. Um, so when you're under stress, your blood pressure tends to go up due to changes the hypothalamus is regulating this. Hormones can regulate blood pressure in short term. Um, things such as like epinephrine and norepinephrine can increase the cardiac output. They can cause vasoconstriction. Angiotensin II stimulates vasoconstriction. ADH, uh, high levels of that can cause vasoconstriction. And then also the arterial natriuretic peptide decreases blood pressure. And so this is a, a chart showing some of the hormones and the effect on blood pressure. Long-term uh, mechanisms are going to involve the kidneys, the renal regulation. Um, so there are receptors that will adapt to chronic or long-term high or low blood pressure. So they're ineffective for long-term regulations. So long-term regulation is going to be controlled by changing the blood volume in the kidneys. So how does it work? There's indirect and direct. 
the direct renal mechanism, um, it can alter the blood volume. It's not involved hormones at all. Basically, how does it affect the blood volume? In the kidneys, you're going to be filtering the blood. So you remove a lot of substances in the first step, which is filtration. And then in the second step and third step, you have reabsorption and secretion. What are you putting back into the blood? Well, if you need to increase blood pressure, then you can, um, in the filtration process, re remove a lot of the water from the blood and basically increase your urine output. So that if you're reducing the water, amount of water in the blood, that means you're reducing uh, the volume, increasing that blood pressure. If there's decreased blood pressure, then what you want to do is conserve water, put more water back into the blood, and um, then that's going to help then increase the, the blood pressure back up again. So the kidney is basically in this direct mechanism. It's regulating how much water you're going to put in the urine. And that in turn has, like I say, this is for a long, a long term effect on the blood pressure. And this is showing here on this diagram the direct, as I said, has to do with the formation of urine. How much water do you put in it? And then indirect is uh, with the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone complex, which is hormonal. So you re what happens here, when blood pressure is decreased, it causes the release of the renin from the kidneys. The renin enters the blood, and it starts this uh, sequence of events, converting angiotensin that's in the liver to angiotensin 1, <coughs> uh, <clears throat> and then angiotensin uh, 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 in the lung, so it's evolving now. Initially, renin from the kidneys, angiotensin 1 from the, the liver, and then 2 in the lungs. And angiotensin 1 is going to uh, stimulate aldosterone secretion, uh, stimulates release of ADH. It's going to trigger you to uh, want to drink more because it's going to activate the thirst center and then it also acts as a vasoconstrictor. Bottom line, increase of blood pressure. So once again, here's the chart showing that. So the idea with blood pressure is you need to keep it with a normal range. So it needs to be high enough so that you have what we call tissue perfusion. You have so that in the capillaries, um, there's enough pressure that the nutrients and the oxygen can move out of the blood and into the interstitial fluid. That's the fluid between the tissues, providing the cells with the nutrients and the gases that they need and then obtaining the waste products. If blood pressure in the brain is too low, the person is ultimately going to lose consciousness. If the blood pressure is too high in the brain, the person can suffer from a stroke. And this is um, a summary of all the different factors that can affect the mean arterial pressure. Things such as dehydration, uh, different stressors. Are you under a crisis situation? Are you exercising? What's your body size, etc.?